Since the dawn of time, people have looked up at the evening sky and dreamed of traveling to Earth's nearest neighbor. On July 20th, 1969, as Neil Armstrong started down the ladder to the lunar surface, a dream as old as humanity was about to come true. In the years leading up to this moment, the American space program was plagued with failures and death. Many of the world's top scientists were certain a moon landing was impossible. This is the incredible story of the historic flight of Apollo 11. It was against the backdrop of the Cold War that the American and Russian race to the moon emerged. With the early Russian successes in space, the truly fearful West believed that Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev was fully capable of making good on his boast that the entire world would someday sleep under a red communist moon. The early American effort in space, however, proved disastrous at nearly every turn. As the entire world watched in wonder, the U.S. news media aptly supplied wide coverage to several ruinous missions, in sharp contrast to the highly guarded, top-secret Russian space program of which little or nothing was known. We were on the verge of having a robust capability uh, that could take us to the moon. At least we could conceive of what it would look like on paper, but the actual systems we had at the time uh, were relatively fragile and relatively unreliable. Uh, I remember looking at film of, uh, of launches, frankly, most of which seemed to end up in a disaster rather than a successful uh, launch to space. I believe this was probably the, the most dangerous uh, period of uh, space life because the uh, spaceships that we were flying were not particularly reliable. Uh, we had lost the uh, Mercury Atlas uh, one in three missions. Uh, prior to the John Glenn, we had had problems on uh, several of the, uh, the atlases. Uh, the technology was, was very primitive at that period of time. Thus, at the height of the Cold War, the American Space Agency, NASA, held a distant and dismal second place to the formidable Russian space program, and America seemed destined to remain permanently overshadowed in space by the seemingly superior Russian program. The beginnings of the American successes that was to ultimately culminate with Apollo 11 started to surface during Project Mercury. During these missions, lone astronauts rode spacecraft into Earth orbit, Although fine accomplishments in and of themselves, the Americans were still a long way from walking on the moon's surface. Upon the completion of Project Mercury, NASA moved into Project Gemini, which was capable of transporting two astronauts. Still, the remaining technological hurdles were nothing short of daunting. You've got to remember, Mercury was an not a maneuverable vehicle go up and come down and that's all. It had no maneuvering capability. So that was the first thing we wanted to do was maneuver. The second thing we wanted to do was could it go, could it go find somebody up there? Could it go do a job up there? Could it go rendezvous with something? Could it go dock with something? Could it, could you attach a, 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 a rocket to it and go to someplace else? Those were all the things we were thinking about when we came to Gemini. There were four major objectives of the Gemini program. Computer-controlled re-entry to improve guidance that would contribute to return from the moon guidance. That was one objective. Rendezvous of spacecraft was uh, another objective so that we could do lunar orbit rendezvous to uh, come back from the moon. Long duration flight so that we could assure that the human could uh, exist uh, comfortably uh, or at least uh, survive up to two weeks, which was the longest possible lunar mission that we might have. That was uh, another objective. <clears throat> the final objective uh, of uh, the Gemini program, number four, was space walking or EVA, 
so we could convince ourselves that we could build the spacesuits and the human could operate independent of the spacecraft on the lunar surface. So all those four objectives really bridge the gap between Mercury and Apollo. Project Gemini require not only perfection of brand new hardware, but the creation of new techniques to deal with time delays and testing the procedures for getting a spacecraft to the moon. An additional challenge was utilizing the vehicle's own pilot craft as the platform to return to Earth. Just as momentum was building within the U.S. space program, tragedy struck. Two astronauts, Elliot C. and Charles Bassett, died in a plane crash during their Gemini training. Later, several other astronauts narrowly survived near-fatal accidents during the testing of the new Gemini technology. Given the monumental task and pace before them, many more things could have gone horribly wrong. So it, it again was kind of a spooky uh, experience. As again, we learned, uh, and by the way, felt that we were being smiled on and watched over by someone smarter than us because uh, any of the things that we had run into could have turned out much worse uh, than they did. It was the mission of the Apollo program to master each technological feat and then land on the moon. Believing that astronaut casualties were now behind them, NASA forged ahead. Tragically, the three astronauts of the very first Apollo, Apollo 1, were instantly killed during a routine ground test. A flash fire in the capsule caused by a short circuit instantly ended the lives of talented astronauts Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee. With NASA's moon goal seemingly beyond reach, little time was lost and the overall effort was accelerated. Apollo 8 successfully orbited the moon. Apollo 9 tested the lunar lander in Earth orbit. And Apollo 10 took the lander module to the moon as a dress rehearsal for the lunar landing. Each mission was integral to the first lunar landing attempt that was to be Apollo 11. I think if there was anything that got us there, it was the, the tremendous effort of the people we had. And, and I think that that can be emphasized too greatly in Apollo. It was the people that did it and not any machines or, or uh, any inventions or uh, any one particular people's uh, courage or astronaut courage or anything like that. It was a, an effort of a large number of people who really devoted their entire life to making it happen. The crew of Apollo 11 was comprised of some of the most experienced and best trained of all astronauts. However, at the time missions were being assigned, no one knew which flight would be the historic trip to the moon. Apollo 11 commander was astronaut Neil Armstrong, a proven veteran of the Gemini program. In March 1966, he had previously commanded the first mission to rendezvous and dock with a target vehicle in space in Gemini 8. After he and his crewmate Dave Scott successfully docked with the target vehicle, a malfunctioning thruster caused the two spacecraft to spin out of control. Armstrong skillfully undocked the two vehicles without damage, although his spacecraft continued to spin to the point where both men nearly lost consciousness and the spacecraft almost spun out of control and off into outer space. In an amazingly cool manner, Armstrong identified the problem and stabilized the spacecraft with only seconds to spare. It was this sure confidence that earned Armstrong the commander post of the Apollo 11 mission. Those same skills once again saved Armstrong only weeks before the historic Apollo 11 mission. In the course of testing a research model of the lunar landing training vehicle, the vehicle malfunctioned and careened out of control. Again, with only seconds to spare, Armstrong ejected at less than 75 meters just before the vehicle crashed. Had Armstrong remained inside, the accident would surely have resulted in his certain death.
Armstrong's crewmate in the trip to the lunar surface was Colonel Buzz Aldrin, third in his class at West Point, who received a PhD in orbital mechanics from MIT prior to becoming an astronaut. It was Aldrin who more or less single-handedly rescued the Gemini program when he developed new spacewalk techniques during Gemini 12. Aldrin's successes in the last Gemini mission gave NASA the boost in confidence they needed to proceed with an aggressive moon landing schedule and earned Aldrin his seat next to Armstrong on Apollo 11. The third crewmate on Apollo 11 was Michael Collins, another experienced Gemini astronaut who drew an assignment unique among astronauts. His mission was to remain in the orbiting command module while his crewmates used the lunar lander to descend to the moon. Collins was an expert in the techniques of rendezvous and docking, owing to his experience in Gemini 10 with John Young. During that mission, they rendezvoused and docked with two unmanned Agena vehicles and then used the Agena's boosters to set new altitude records. Originally, Collins was assigned to the first manned mission to orbit the moon on board Apollo 8, but was forced off that flight as a result of a bone spur in his neck that required minor surgery. He was later reassigned to the next available flight, Apollo 11. With a series of impressive accomplishments to their credit, the crew members of Apollo 11 were ready to take their place in history when launch day came on July 16, 1969. Well, every launch uh, day is uh, a time of uh, excitement, enthusiasm, and apprehension. But I think uh, in most circumstances, uh, you always feel that the chances of actually lifting off are, <laughs> are fairly distant or remote. And uh, you have to temper your enthusiasm, enthusiasm with the realization that, uh, in fact, you may be coming back in and trying to go another day. I think the momentous, uh, most memorable thing that I can call about that particular day was the opportunity while my, uh, my two friends here were being put into the spacecraft to uh, stand alone by myself uh, out there and look at the rocket and the quietness and see the sun come up and waves rolling in and the evidence of the millions of people uh, watching, but, but nothing specific and just so quiet and to realize that indeed uh, such a contrast is going to take place, all the frantic activity preparing the rocket that was so quiet up there for me personally, and that in a very few moments uh, we were going to be uh, departing in a, in a great roar and offer a momentous uh, event.
Apollo 11 proved to be a textbook launch, setting the crew on course for their appointment with the moon. However, excitement was cautiously kept in check by the knowledge that space travel is a very unforgiving undertaking. There are uh, there's so many things that can go wrong on a trip to the moon and back. Uh, it's sort of a long and fragile daisy chain of events. Of course, all three of us had uh, flown in orbit before and seen, uh, seen the wonders of Earth as seen from space. This was a new experience for us in seeing it from a fairly long distance away. It does probably have a, a change in character uh, as you come far, farther away. I think you most notice that, though, at the time you leave Earth. Uh, when you're departing at, at a great rate, it's, it's very clear that this is an unusual experience. <laughs> I've got the word you wanted to hear. You are go for TLI. You're go for the moon. Hello, hello, Mr. Houston. How do you read? Three hours after liftoff, the Apollo command module moved forward to extract the lunar module from the third stage of the launch vehicle. Both were moving at 17,000 miles an hour, and afterwards the crew settled in for the three-day trip to the moon. Oh, loud and clear now, Mike, and we understand that you are, Doc. From our point of view, uh, the command module was uh, a wonderful improvement over our previous spacecraft. It was really current. So uh, we enjoyed the, the luxury of a big volume machine. I thought we had amazingly good accommodations. Uh, we had hot and cold water. The food was even edible. Uh, all in all, it was, uh, it was, a, it was a nicely uh, packaged uh, uh, small enclosure, and uh, we could comfortably have stayed there far in excess of eight days. I think it was a treat. It was certainly a, a major step upward. It was a marvel of technology and uh, had the company of two uh, enjoyable people to, to keep us uh, occupied. Uh, I think occasionally we'd get to, to drag a little bit on, I think, in a very long duration mission in, inside the command service module. But thanks to the experiences that we'd had previously in flight, we saw to it that there were adequate windows and, and quite a few of them to look out. After traveling more than a quarter million miles across the emptiness of space, the spacecraft finally reached the moon and was readied for lunar orbit. The thing about the, uh, the moon that I thought was peculiar was that it seemed to depend on the, uh, the angle of the sun. Uh, when the sun was uh, almost overhead and it was noon down below, the, uh, the moon appeared to be a, a warm and a friendly place. Uh, on the other hand, uh, near dawn or dusk, it became uh, very uh, foreboding looking. The uh, craters cast very long shadows and the place looked uh, distinctly unfriendly. So I, I, I was intrigued by the, the contrast uh, based purely on uh, what angle the sun happened to be coming from. On the morning of July 20th, the anticipated moment of lunar orbit and descent had arrived. However, the true test of many years of preparation lay just ahead. Armstrong and Aldrin entered their lunar lander, named Eagle, and powered up the systems while Collins remained in the command module. The uh, spacecraft is uh, behind the moon and we go into what we call battle short in the control center. Battle short is where we actually physically block the circuit breakers and the main feeders for this building such that if we'd have a power fault, we'd prefer to burn up the circuit rather than to have that circuit breaker open uh, prematurely. As soon as uh, GC says, hey, we're in battle short condition, we lock the doors to the room because we don't want anybody walking in 
and distracting us at critical times. The first thing I heard was the uh, flight director, Gene Krantz, come on the, uh, come on the intercom. And he gave us a speech that I think General Patton would have been proud of. He said, folks, we're here. We are going to succeed. You've been trained. You know what to do. And we're going to go do it. But then he said something was even better. He said, but no matter how it turns out, I'm going to be with you. And no matter what you do, I'm going to be right behind you. And you can't imagine what that meant to a bunch of young fellows who, like myself, were only 25 or 26 years old. Okay, all flight controllers going around the horn, gonna go for undocking. Okay, retro, go. Fido, go. Guide, go. Control, go. Telcom, go. Gincy, go. Ecom, go. Surgeon, go. Capcom, we're go for undocking. Hello, Eagle, Houston, we're standing by, over. Eagle, Houston, we, Houston, we see you on the stereo, over. Roger, Eagle, undocked. Roger, how does it look? Eagle has wings. Roger. Zero, 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 nine or eight. I think perhaps uh, the final descent to the lunar surface Plus, was, uh, zero, for me, zero, the highlight seven, of the flight. It's very challenging. Uh, there's a lot of Plus, unknowns. Zero, uh, zero, and uh, it was, uh, zero, for a pilot, zero, it, it seven, was uh, four, a wonderful experience. Zero, three, zero, zero, as soon as the, zero, the comm came in good and solid, two, and we saw zero, good telemetry three, data, the first thing that happened was we saw, zero, I saw, zero, that there was a 20 foot per second uh, velocity error zero, in the onboard zero, computer. Zero, now that came from the fact that we'd started at the wrong place. We just couldn't predict perfectly where we were going to be and what speed we were going to be when we started the uh, the descent. The problem is, at 35 feet per second, we have to abort. So here we are, riding right along this abort ledge, just inside it, and wondering, is this an initial error, or is this something that's going to grow? Because if we had an accelerometer problem, a gyro problem, it was going to grow, and we were going to have to call an abort. And that was something that was going to be my call, and I dreaded this sort of thing all along. Okay, all flight controllers, going to go for landing. Retro. Go. Fido. Go. Guidance. Go. Control. Go. Telcom. Go. GNC. Go. Ecom. Go. Surgeon. Go. Capcom, we're go for landing. Altitude 4200. Houston, you're a go for landing. Over. I do understand. Go for landing. 3,000 feet. Looking great. Everything is, is good. We're back on track. I, I thought, boy, this is, uh, things are going to work out fine. Go. Thirty seconds later, after I thought things were going to work out fine, we got the first program along. Now, if you listen to the tape, the crew talks about it first. You hear Neil Armstrong say, 1201, program alarm. Twelve oh one is sounds as four little four little numbers sounds sort of ah ho hum, but what it really means is, hey bud. I had too much to do that last second. I didn't get it all done, and I hope that I've done the most important things. And it's up to you to figure out if I've done the most important things, because I'm going on, I can't stop. And that's what that was all about. Well, when I saw those come up, uh, my first thought, uh-oh, abort, you know, a computer, because always doing in a simulation, a computer glitch like that was, uh, it was the data dropped out, the computer stopped computing and everything just went to, you know, hell in a handbasket. Just as the ground control engineers were trying to come to grips with understanding what caused the 1201 alarm, another series of alarms went off, indicating another potential situation hindering the moon descent. Eagle looking great. Roger, 1202, we copy it. Now, what we were concerned about, there's another computer alarm, which was called a, a PUDU, which means do program zero, zero. Program zero, zero is where the computer says, hey, I don't have enough time to do anything. I'm going to go to idle and wait for further instructions. We were worried that we might force ourselves into that particular type alarm, and there we would have to, we'd be in the, uh, we'd either have to be in a landing position, select the abort guidance system and try to land or abort. I mean, that was a bad case. I look around, I see it's not coming too fast. I see that the velocity's okay, the altitude's okay. 
And about 10 seconds after the alarm, we call a go. I say, flight, we're going at alarm. Give us a reading on the 1202 program alarm. Roger, we got you. We're going at alarm. Good radar data. We're now in the approach phase. Everything looking good. Just right when the crew really needed it, because they called down and said, how are we doing? What's, what's going on? Which is their way of saying, hey, what's going on? Give us a quick reading. Uh, we said go very confidently, and they uh, put their head back in the cockpit and kept flying. Altitude, velocity, light. The, the tension in mission control was so real, you could cut it with a knife. And, and I'm just babbling along on these, you know, giving them updates and this and that and the other. And Deke Slayton was sitting right next to me uh, during that final few minutes. And, uh, and about the last minute, he hit me in the side and said, whispered, shut up, Charlie, and let them land. <laughs> and so I got real quiet. Uh, I get a call from the controllers that says, hey, we've hit the uh, DIPS, which is Descent Propulsion System, low level discrete. And that sets my metal clock running and the clock of all the controllers in the room running that, hey, we only got two minutes of hover time, hover fuel remaining. And uh, we know the crew isn't down near the surface yet. And pretty soon this clock, this time starts moving agonizingly slow down here. And then the next call we get is 60 seconds. We still haven't landed the moon, and we're uh, well beyond our experience base for, uh, for landing there. Uh, we get another call at 45 seconds, still haven't landed. In our simulations, we're accustomed to having a large number of these kinds of difficulties, and we had, in fact, simulated uh, landing with very small amounts of fuel left, so uh, I didn't feel that this was a, an oppressive uh, situation, not that we weren't concerned about it. Uh, we certainly were because there were serious matters. We get down at 30 seconds, we get a 30 second call, and at this time you over the, the voice uh, path from the crew, the air ground from the crew, you start hearing we're kicking up dust. So we now knew we were pretty close down to the surface. At which time, uh, all we did from then on, we weren't communicating with the crew except for very terse call-outs on time. 30 seconds. 15 seconds. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. We copy you down, Eagle. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. We were close. I think we were within 10 to 7 seconds of fuel before we, uh, we landed. We were about 6 seconds away from the ground calling an abort. That wouldn't have been my call. That would have been uh, another engineer's in this room. But he was within a few seconds. My problem was I had to keep talking. I had to keep working because I had a series of stay-no-stay no stay decisions uh, that we had to make. Because in case the LEM spacecraft had been damaged during the descent, or some of the temperatures, possibly we got into a, a soft landing area where it started to tip off. We had to be ready to abort at any time. So I had to keep my controllers, my entire team, team grinding away for what we call the T1 stay no stay decision. The things you have to hang on to are your buddies down here that are right there with you and the flight director is gonna stand behind you no matter what. And even though you're scared, you can function and operate. Now, I don't say everybody in this room was scared. I just me. I was always scared. I was scared during the sin. I was scared during the mission. I don't have any problem saying that. The technological problems of landing aside, at least one renowned scientist had great fears as to whether Armstrong and Aldrin would even survive the landing. Some predicted that the dust covering the moon's surface would explode upon contact with the lunar lander's engines. That issue arose because of a scientist by the name of Thomas Gold, who uh, tended to take a little bit of data and make extreme extrapolations from it. And he convinced a senator and some high-ranking NASA officials that this was a problem, that the moon dust would ignite. There was a piece of evidence that he had from the pictures from the Severe spacecraft that showed that dust was collecting on the spacecraft, and this meant it was hopping around with electrical charges and could get in the Apollo module at Ignite and so on. 
Ultimately, this fear proved groundless, and the first successful landing on the moon's surface became history. For the moment, the crew had to push aside any remaining anxiety and anticipation for their walk on the moon. There was still work to be done and checkouts to be performed inside the lunar excursion module before venturing outside. Through the window of the eagle, Armstrong and Aldrin took in what no human had seen before. We had hours to stand there a mere 15 feet, say, above the surface and uh, look at pretty much uh, everything that was available out the front windows. Uh, we had a sense of the gravity, uh, the character of the, of the environment there. So uh, long before we actually got out on the surface, we already had pretty good appreciation for what the moon was like. The crew, as they had been trained, were looking out the windows and they were describing the terrain that we had landed in. As the crew was describing this, I could see the puzzlement on the controller's faces that said, this isn't where we expected to be. Well, that was obvious because we had landed long, but we thought from the crew description we'd be able to plot the position and the geologists in the back room were confused. On Sunday, July 20th, 1969, almost seven hours after touchdown, it was a go for the crew's historic moonwalk. As more than one billion people simultaneously watched on their televisions, momentarily brought together by this unprecedented event, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin readied themselves to turn an age-old dream into reality. Tempering the astronauts' eager anticipation to walk the lunar surface, was the lingering fear of potential danger and death. And that, and that the astronauts would step off out of the spacecraft and sink out of sight if the spacecraft hadn't already sunk out of sight, that they needed snowshoes to walk around because there was going to be all this incredible depth of dust and, and so on. I'm going to step off the limb. That's one small step for man. First thing you do, first thing we did when we got out of that spacecraft was go get some rocks. Do nothing else, just get a whole, just pick up some rocks, put them in a bag, and put that in the spacecraft in case, in case we had to get the hell out of there. That's what we did. Okay, we've done that and we're satisfied everything's okay on the moon. Now we'll go put out the instruments. We did that. What's the minimum instruments you can have on this flight? Because we don't want to spend a whole lot of time on the moon. We want to get off of there. We want to come back and think about all this stuff and make sure that we did it right and that it was, everything was okay. I think I was relieved by the ease that we had in being able to move around. Uh, perhaps impressed by the, the talcum powder nature of, of the fine surface itself. As you'd look at a boot print, it just was so smooth, uh, just like you'd uh, put your foot in talcum powder. It, it was just a many faceted uh, moon. It was a stranger to me uh, before the mission, but it, I now look back at it as somewhat of a friend, a place that I've visited. Beautiful view. Isn't that something? Magnificent sight out here. Magnificent desolation. Well, well, it's it's very, very, very fine, fine powder, isn't it? Isn't it fine? Hey, Neil, didn't I say we might see some purple rocks? Find a purple rock? Yep. Very small. 
With about two and a half hours allocated for the moonwalk, most of the time was dedicated to collecting rocks, planting the American flag, and erecting a few key scientific experiments. When we first had to interface with the scientists, the, the paleontologists, the planetologists, and the geologists, and the seismologists, and the, all those learned doctors, they didn't like us worth a damn. They wanted to do all this fancy science on the moon. That wasn't our job at the time. Our job was to get that goddamn thing there and back safely. The guys that flew in it safely. And I would say, look, don't bother me with that now. Tell me what's the minimum amount I can do to satisfy you and let me go get it done. One of the experiments consisted of a package to detect moonquakes and meteorite impacts, while a laser ranging reflector helped to accurately measure Earth-Moon distances, and a solar wind experiment detected particles of solar wind blowing onto the lunar surface. When we're on the surface of the moon, uh, even though the, the Earth was only a slight, slight 24 degrees off the vertical, uh, there was no uh, traction on my part to, to divert my attention from you know, where we were and what we were doing, to look up at it, uh, except for the one time when we tried to take a moving picture, or a stirring picture, a memorable picture, and uh, it certainly, in retrospect, looked awfully small. Uh, personally, uh, there was a time when, uh, when an ironic thought sort of filtered through my mind that uh, here Neil and I were so far away from uh, home, much further than people have ever been, and yet at that same time there were more thoughts, concerns back so far away on what it is that we were doing at that very moment. After two hours and 31 minutes, the astronauts completed their work on the moon and returned to their lunar lander. With no wind or rain on the moon, the footprints of Armstrong and Aldrin will remain for centuries. Astronaut Collins remained behind to pilot the command module named Columbia and was orbiting the moon. During this time, he had occasion for much serious contemplation. A minor functional error could leave him floating in space forever. Well, I enjoyed being in the command module by myself. It was a, a happy little home. Uh, all the machinery was working properly. Uh, and uh, my, my concerns uh, were not within the command module, but simply that something might go wrong with the uh, LAM, with the lunar module, and these two guys might get stuck on the surface of the moon. That was my, my main concern. Back into lunar orbit. Capcom. Econ. Surgeon. GNC. Guidance, you happy? Go. Fido. Go. Capcom or go for liftoff. Tranquility Base, uh, Houston, you're cleared for takeoff. Roger, understand. We're number one on the runway. Perhaps the most dangerous aspect of the entire mission was the ascent phase, when the astronauts lifted off from the lunar surface. Nearly every system of the mission was equipped with backups, double redundant machinery and equipment, with the exception of one. There could be only one lightweight engine that would lift the crew up and off the lunar surface. If the engine failed to start, astronauts Armstrong and Aldrin would have become permanent monuments on the moon. On July 21st, the ascent engine performed perfectly, and the Eagle spacecraft and crew Eagle said Houston, goodbye right to the moon. The Everything's great.
For Commander Collins in the command module, the approaching Eagle was a welcome sight. After docking together, Armstrong, Aldrin, and their priceless cargo of moon rocks were transferred into the command module. The lunar lander was jettisoned and ultimately fell back and crashed on the moon. The crew was anxious to return home, but they were still three days and a quarter million miles away. The key thing is this business that we're in is absolutely intolerant of carelessness neglect, incapacity. There's a lot of surprises. There's a high risk. There's nothing conservative about the business that we're in. So basically, we hold back until we are absolutely sure that our job is done. Then we will sit back and we'll celebrate. On July 24th, Apollo streaked across the heavens headed towards Earth at 25,000 miles an hour, and the Navy rescue team was right there to greet them when the parachutes came out. I think in, in 11, from my personal standpoint, uh, we brought the flags out in this room. And I think that sort of said, hey, thank God for America, and thank God for this country that has let us work in such a marvelous program. Then we passed around cigars in this thing here, and this is one we, we could smoke in the controls. And people would do this, and we'd light up the cigars. And that was, hey, our thanks to the team. Then we met with the other crews and the program managers. We opened the doors to this room. And these hundreds of people would come into the room, all of whom had one little piece of this mission, but without whom we couldn't have done this mission. There was a, just a feeling of uh, togetherness, uh, bond, unity, accomplishment. Uh, it was just uh, the most marvelous feelings in my entire life that existed in this room. Due to a very real fear that the astronauts could ferry back with them moon germs or some other alien life form capable of contaminating and killing off all life on Earth, the crew was immediately put into strict quarantine for over two weeks. By the middle of August, the journey was over and the crew was safely returned home to Houston but they went on to become three of the greatest heroes in the history of humanity. Although some argue that the moon missions cost too much for too little, the Apollo program was truly a bargain. 
it cost taxpayers a sum amounting to only one-third of one percent of the gross national product in 1970. Yet the technical and scientific knowledge gained from it was immeasurable and still yields benefits today. In the decades that have passed since those first footsteps on the moon, Apollo 11 remains as one of the greatest achievements in the history of human endeavors. The moon was not the finish line, but merely the first step in the eventual exploration of the universe. There's an increasing momentum to, uh, to go back to the moon. There are studies of the moon are indicating more and more new reasons why uh, it does make sense to go back, but uh, I'm not in a position to say right now when we might make that next trip. I'd, I'd prefer to see us go to Mars rather than go back to the moon, unless we need the moon as a stepping stone to Mars. It could be that in studying Mars, uh, you will discover that the best way to do it is by way of a of a base on the moon, and if that turns out to be the case, uh, well and good, but uh, I, I see the moon really not as an end in itself, but really a stepping stone to uh, the deeper space, to Mars and to the planets beyond. I feel that uh, as humans expand outward that they should be in a, uh, in a gradual, uh, continuous self-sustaining way, and I suspect that it will involve uh, visiting the moon simultaneously or in uh, in melding together with our, uh, our uh, growing visits of humans to Mars. I am encouraged by the fact that there are so many people asking those questions, which uh, seems to assure me that our uh, future has a great deal of uh, promise. Well, I think uh, a Martian astronaut would probably be better off studying uh, the voyages of Vasco da Gama or Lewis and Clark rather than he would uh, listening to uh, the three people who'd spent only uh, only eight days out on the on the road uh, round trip uh, for a Mars mission is going to be in the vicinity of two and a half years and that's uh, close in duration to, to those of the early explorers. I think Mike's right uh, uh, the trip to Mars is going to be a very long and involved and uh, major segment of a person's life and and there's going to be uh, a lot of times to be thinking about it, discussing it uh, in route beforehand and, and, and afterward. Uh, the nation needs a strong uh, goal, strong objective, and Mars is a much clearer one to uh, use as our compelling drawing force into the future. <laughs>